Um, I'm going to speak today on some of the fundamental questions in complexity theory, in particular on progress that's been made, uh, not as much as we would have wished, but still progress towards the P versus NP question. I think most people have heard of the P versus NP question. It's one of the most important questions in computer science, uh, along with a number of other related questions. Uh, but want to focus on this in particular, or problems around it, uh, whether non-determinism helps computation. Uh, but there's other very important questions, like whether log space equals P. Just a second, let's see here. So L is log space, P is polynomial time or whether polynomial space is equal to polynomial time uh, are also equally important and maybe questions that should be studied even before the question whether P equals NP. Um, in particular, we have the log space as a subset of polynomial time as a subset of NP as a subset of P space. And so that's it. if you're trying to prove separations, it would be easier, for instance, to separate P from P space, or at least no harder to separate P from P space, or L from NP, uh, because of course P not equal NP would already imply those types of, types of separations. On the other hand, we do know that log space is not equal to polynomial space by the space hierarchy. I'll be talking about that in this talk here. Okay. So let's just start off from the beginning. Why do we conjecture P not equal NP? Okay, uh, it's a good question. I have a couple answers here. They're not very good answers. Well, the first one is because people have attempted to prove P equal NP and failed. Uh, this is a bad argument, of course, because people have also attempted to prove P not equal NP and failed. But uh, nonetheless, and then uh, answer two here is that there's oracle results give barriers on using diagonalization to separate P and NP. Of course, there's also oracle results showing it's hard to show their equals, so I guess that answer could go either way as, either way as well. Uh, another reason not listed on the slide is there's analogies to, for instance, recursive versus recursively enumerable. These classes are different, and somehow P and NP are viewed as an analog of those questions. Uh, the first uses of diagonalization were useful mostly for proving the time and space hierarchies. So these were Hartmanis, Lewis, Stearns, and Stearns and Hartmanis uh, now exactly 50 years ago proved the time and space hierarchy. So for instance, log space is not equal to polynomial space. Polynomial time is not equal to exponential time. And I'll, I'll sketch these arguments in just a moment for you. Okay. So this somewhat repeats what I just said here, but the oracle separation, again, shows it's hard to give stronger diagonalization results because there's oracles that collapse log space to NP. There's also oracles that collapse P and P space. So any proof of separation must, must not relativize. In other words, it can't work relative to an oracle. And so any proof of P not equal NP must use methods that, that don't work in the presence of oracles. Uh, however, in this talk, I want to concentrate on the positive aspects, so what diagonalization is able to do. And we have some, you know, there's been some surprisingly strong results in this. Uh, in the uh, interest of full disclosure, there's other barriers as well that I'm not going to talk about, but you might look up if you don't know. Natural proofs and al algebraization are the two other main classes of barriers towards proving separation results. But I, I'm not going to talk about them in this talk. So here's a plan for the talk. I'll talk about several hierarchies. You can read them on the screen. But let me, on this slide, remind you the complexity classes again. Uh, log space at the bottom, subset of polynomial time, subset of non-deterministic po polynomial time, subset of P space, subset of exponential time. And the space hierarchy tells us that log space is not equal to P space, and that polynomial time is not equal to polynomial space. Uh, Sorry, polynomial time is not equal to exponential time, and no other separations are known for these classes. So anything else that you seems co compatible with those two things is possible as far as we know. Um, honestly, it's a fairly embarrassing state of affairs for computer science, but that just that makes research in this area all the more exciting because there's still very important problems left to solve. Okay. So, before I get into the more technical parts of the talk, let me just say, what is our wish? How would we like to separate P versus NP? So we'd like to separate it the way that recursive was separated from recursively enum enumerable. And there were 
These two types of classical uses due to Girdle and Turing of similar results. So Girdle in completeness theorem uh, was proved by making a formula that says, I am not provable, you know, or using the liar paradox or something like that. Uh, the halting problem, being undecidable, can be phrased in a sort of similar way. You form a Turing machine M that says sort of like, I halt if and only if I do not halt. Okay, so this is how you would show the halting problem is und und undecidable. These kind of th approaches actually with self-reference don't seem to work in the setting of complexity theory as far as I know. They're a little bit too strong. But diagonalization underlies these things. So diagonalization can still be made to do useful things here. So, di so diagonalization, uh, for it's just a classical use, just to give an example, is to show that not all recursively enumerable sets are recursive you assume for a contradiction that they are all recursive. And then you can form a recursive predicate P, which has the property that P accepts an input I, if and only if the ith Turing machine M sub I does, does not accept, uh, actually, say, if and only if it, it rejects the in, in, in input I. Uh, and then you can show very quickly that PI would be recursive if the RE sets are all recursive but it's not equal to any one of the recursive, any of the things computed by Turing machines. It differs from the ith one on the ith input sufficiently often. <coughs> so this argument uses a universal Turing machine. We have a way of evaluating the ith Turing machine, what it does. Okay, that's an important ingredient for us. So this is the kind of template that we want to follow for diagonalization proofs. Okay, and this is indeed exactly the template used for the space hierarchy. So let me step through the proof here. Uh, we have two functions, s and t, and the function s is, grows slower than the function t. In particular, s of n is little o of t of n. <coughs> the conclusion is that space of s is not equal to space of t. So let's just do some of the background. We're working with Turing machines with K-tapes, with a finite alphabet gamma, with, <coughs> excuse me, with binary strings as input, and they always output a yes-no answer, except reject. Run times are stated as a function of the length n of the input. Okay, the space used is the total number of tape squares or memory, and we use big O or little o notation because constant factors at runtime don't make any difference. Uh, in particular, the alphabet size can change. <coughs> <coughs> so here's a proof sketch. If we start off with the following fact. Any, there's a one tape u, 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 universal Turing machine, UT, such that for any Turing machine, the eth Turing machine, m sub e, using space s, there's some constant c sub e, such that u sub t on input a pair of numbers, e x, uses space order s, in particular c sub e times s, and outputs the same answer as the eth Turing machine on in input x, unless c sub e times s is greater than t, if the space gets bigger than t, the machine just aborts and doesn't do anything. <clears throat> but of course, by making x large enough, since s is little o of t, this abort condition won't kick in for large x. <clears throat> we define the Turing machine n, which on an input a pair e x, it runs the u t on input e comma e, e x, and then it outputs the opposite answer. It outputs yes instead of no, or no instead of yes. And then, by construction, the Turing machine n is in space t because it just aborts if the time is bigger than t. But if you take the machine m sub e that's in space s and you take x large enough, then n of ex is the opposite of the universal ut of e comma ex, which is the same as m e of ex. So n of ex is different than m sub e of ex, so n is different from m, m sub e on that in input. So it's not equal to that machine, and that worked for all space S machines, so N is not in space S. And that's the proof. So 
Why is it hard? It's not really particularly hard. Uh, maybe the trickiest part was this first fact here about the one tape Turing machine, but that's pretty easy. Remember, we have to simulate K-tape Turing machines, right? But with a one tape Turing machine. But we can just take all K-tapes and compress them onto a single tape and then uh, shuttle the tape head back and forth and do the same type of work with a single tape that the machines do with K-tapes. Um, the time hierarchy is a little more complicated, but has the same sort of proof idea. So here we have an unwanted factor log, in, log S of n, but it reflects the best we can prove. So suppose S of n grows s more slowly than T of n, so that S of n times lo log S of n is little o of T of n. Then the conclusion is time of S, the, the set of predicates that can be computed in time of S is a subset of a proper subset that what can be computed in time of t. So here's the proof idea. It's the same proof as before. We just say now there's a two-tape universal Turing machine V using space t, I call it Vt, so that for any Turing machine m sub e using time s, there's a constant c sub e, all this is as before, such that Vt of ex uses time, now it's c sub e times s times log of s, and outputs m e of x unless the time is bigger than the allotted time t, in which case it's just, it just rejects, um, or I should say aborts. And this log factor reflects the fact that you're trying to simulate a K-tape Turing machine, maybe a seven-tape Turing machine using only two tapes. And so you want to move all the data from seven tapes down onto two tapes, and then you have to somehow shuttle the tape head back and forth and compute using only two tapes of memory, what you was being computed by M sub e with seven tapes. And there's some clever tricks to push blocks of data around to make that only take an extra log factor in the runtime. Okay, so that's the time hierarchy. So uh, these are the two classic results um, a diagonalization. Uh, so I want to switch to the next part of the talk. Actually, I should ask, would anyone like to ask a question at this point? Otherwise, there'll be time at the end. I guess not. Okay, I'll give you another chance. Okay, so the time hierarchy for non-deterministic Turing machines is harder. So I'd like to sketch that proof for you, though. So a non-deterministic Turing machine has the ability to guess. So the usual loose way to say this is a Turing machine that's non-deterministic can guess the answer, right? But you can't just guess the answer and be done with it. You have to verify also. So you have to guess and verify. Um, so the point is, if any guess leads to an acceptance state, then the machine accepts. Uh, formally, a non-deterministic Turing machine has multiple possible moves at any particular point. A configuration is called accepting, if either it's explicitly accepting in the terms by being an accepting state, or if one of the legal moves leads to acceptance. Okay, and that's a recursive way to define this. Uh, probably most of you have heard of satisfiability. This is the canonical NP complete problem. Uh, and w this can be accepted by an NP Turing machine by just guessing a satisfying assignment and then verifying that it makes it true. And I'll talk more about this later. So here's the non-deterministic time hierarchy theorem. Uh, I've listed various contributors here. An early version was due to Steve Cook. The version I'm stating here is due to Cypress Fisher-Meyer. The proof I'm giving is due to Zach. And there's been an improved proof recently given by Santh, Nam, and Fortnow, which is well worth looking up if you're interested in this kind of stuff. But uh, I'm just going to present Zach's proof here. Theorem here is the following. We want the function s to grow smaller than the function t. And the assumption is that s of n plus 1 is little o of t of n. There's an unwanted plus 1 there, but OK. It doesn't do much harm, but it still is unwanted. Then the conclusion is that non-deterministic time s is proper subset of non-deterministic time t. OK. So, so let's start the proof sketch. First fact is there is a two-tape universal non-deterministic Turing machine, ut, which has the following property. For any non-deterministic Turing machine m sub e that uses time s, there's some constant c sub e, the same thing as before, such that ut of the input ex uses time c sub e times s, and it accepts if and only if m sub e of x accepts. So it does, it just simulates what m sub e does and does the, op and does, does the same thing, 
the same thing. Unless, of course, the time is too big, in which case we reject. And again, because the little o notation is going to work out for us, uh, if once our inputs are big enough, we don't have this aborting conditions coming in. So this looks very good. This is the kind of thing we had already for the space hierarchy at the beginning. But if you remember the rest of the proof, we, we had first formed UT like this, and then we defined a Turing machine N that flipped the answer, did the opposite. So if, if the mach ETH machine said yes, it's supposed to say no and vice versa. The trouble is, with a, we want UT to be non-deterministic, and we want it to be simulating non-deterministic machines. If you flip the answer, it goes co-non-deterministic. Okay. So this is a problem, because it takes us from existential guesses to universal choices. Okay. So we can't just do the diagonalization this way. But there's a very clever argument due to Zach, which is, as I'll sketch for you. We let uh, capital T sub E of N, T stands for time. T sub E sub N would be the deterministic time to compute M sub E of X. So what I mean by this is, suppose you run through all the exponentially possible uh, choices that M sub E might make, you check them all deterministically to see if any of them lead to acceptance. Okay, well that takes a long time, exponential time. So some, you know, some constant d raised to the power s of n. s of n, think of that as being m sub e's runtime. So it would take exponentially long to, to do this deterministically. And then we, sorry, then we do a throw, it, then we throw in some large amount of slowdown to take advantage of this. So we define, sorry, capital N on input a pair, E and X, followed by a certain number of zeros, to equal the following. It runs the universal Turing machine U, T, on input E, and then the pair E, X, followed by one more zero. So instead of having I zeros, we've got I plus one zeros. And this will be the same as M, E of E, X, and then I plus one zeros. And the point is, this is still okay because the runtime of ME on, with one extra zero there, that's like S of N plus one. So the, the, the input to the ME, the E X zero to the I plus one can be arranged so it has exactly, the length exactly one more than the input that N takes. So M is N is supposed to use time T and M sub E uses time S, but S of n plus 1 is little o of t of n. So we have time to do this, at least for large x's. OK. Now, th we do this unless there's a huge number of zeros there. If there's a huge number of zeros there, then we ignore all the zeros. And we just, if that's so t of n is less than the deterministic time needed to evaluate m sub e, we ignore all those zeros, and we just deterministically evaluate m sub e of e x and take the opposite answer. That's what the not sign here. So the first case there is a non-deterministic computation. The second is a deterministic com computation. And so we've negated there. So the point is we can't have n of e x 0 to the i be equal to m sub e of e x 0 to the i for all i. Because we've arranged that n sub e x 0 i is equal to m sub e uh, m sub e, e, x, 0, i plus 1 for all values of i. And so basically, we've got a lot of equalities, and we can't have a bunch of other equalities and then one inequality stuck in the cycle. There has to be another inequality stuck in there. And so at that point, they're different, and therefore n is not in n time. It's not equal to m sub e for any m sub e that's running in, 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 uh, in time s. So non-deterministic time t contains n but it's not in non-deterministic time S. Okay. It's a complicated but very clever proof. Okay. Okay. Everybody happy? <laughs> so uh, should I repeat any part of the proof? Anyone? No? Okay. Well, you can read it offline. Okay. So uh, let me skip that part of the proof to talk and go to alternation trading proofs. Let me go to the last part of the talk. Oh, here. If you're online, it's part of the permanent record. 
feel free to read it. <laughs> you can, I think that Yandex is going to post these online so you can see them afterwards if you really want to see it. So I want to now go to the third part of the talk, and I want to talk about bounds on alternation trading proofs. Uh, alternation trading proofs are a rather sophisticated use of iterated diagonalization. So we're going to diagonalize sort of over and over again. Uh, and the main method is this uh, restricted space methods of, uh, I should have gotten someone in the audience to pronounce this ahead of me for me, Nepomniaski. <laughs> Neponishi. <laughs> Close enough. Neponishi. Oh, I should really get this down. Nepomniaski. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, at any rate, I'll sketch these proofs for you, but the best results obtained along these lines so far show that satisfiability is not computable by a machine that uses s simultaneously time bounds of n to the c and space bounds of n to the epsilon for certain values of c and epsilon. But epsilon can be greater than or equal to zero, but c can be greater than one. So they are in some sense non-trivial bounds. Okay, because uh, we have non-deterministic time machine that runs in essentially linear time and solves satisfiability. But it's important that the space is severely restricted. Okay. Uh, and I think the right way to think of this is alternation trading proofs are giving partial results towards proving L is not equal to NP. Okay. So separating log space and non-deterministic polynomial time. Okay, so let me remind you of the definition of satisfiability. Uh, an instance of satisfiability is a set of clauses. A clause is a set of literals. Uh, a literal is either a propositional variable like x or a negated propositional variable like not x. And uh, the point, a clause is satisfied if at least one literal in it is made true. So a clause is an or of literals. And a set of clauses is satisfied if every clause in it is made true. So every clause contains at least one literal that's made true. Okay. So famous theorem, uh, the Cook-Levin theorem, satisfiability is NP complete. Uh, the conjecture is that it's not in polynomial time. I already discussed this, that P is not equal to NP. So why is satisfiability important? In some sense, your first thought on seeing the problem of satisfiability I know some of you actually work in a company that writes software, and you've probably never really actually written an algorithm for satisfiability. You don't, you know, C++ doesn't have a function built in to solve satisfiability, nor does the, you know, standard template library or anything have satisfiability as a st standard thing. So it seems a little bit ad hoc. It seems like something a logician would come up with, but no one else would care. But it's still a very important problem for very practical reasons. So the first thing is that uh, many NP-complete problems are many one reducible, that's a slight typo here, it should say many one reducible, to satisfiability in quasi-linear time. So what I mean by that is n times polylog, n times log n to some constant factor. Uh, more specifically, take a non-deterministic Turing machine M, and you ask whether M accepts a particular input X in n steps. Well, you can reduce this to an instance of satisfiability where the size of the instance is n times log n to the O of 1, quasi-linear size. So many problems can be efficiently reduced to satisfiability. Okay. And uh, lower bounds on algorithms for, satisfied, for satisfiability imply lower bounds for many other problems. Okay. Exactly the same type, maybe with some extra log factors in there, but that's it. So it's not just some abstract problem, it's really relevant to the real world. So to make it more relevant to the real world, we're going to switch from the Turing machine model to random access model. So the Turing machine model is a little bit crippled because it's forced to shuttle tape heads back and forth. Random access method, of course, can do direct memory accesses based on addresses. <coughs> and so if we work with that and we give lower bounds on runtime, we're really giving meaningful lower bounds. They're not just lower bounds based on the fact that a Turing machine is he head is shuttling back and forth. They're really lower bounds. Okay. Uh, so I use the notation d time n for deterministic time with n steps, n time n for non-deterministic time with n steps. And here's the sharpened version of the Cook-Levin theorem, which sort of summarizes what I was saying in a rather precise way. Um, 
there is a constant C, so that for any language L that can be computed in non-deterministic time T of n, there's a quasi-linear time, that means n times polylog n, many one reduction from L to instances of satisfiability of size T of n times some log factors. Okay? Not only that, the instance of SAT are very quickly computable. You can, in parallel, compute the symbols of this instance, right? The, an instance of SAT is a set of clauses. You write it out as a set of symbols. You know, uh, the symbols can be computed separately very quickly in time, polylog rhythmic time. Okay. So this gives us a very strong reduction from non-deterministic time computations to instances of satisfiability. And, oh, I should just say here, these polylog factors, can you see this change on the screen? Uh, instead of being a log T of n to the C there factor at the end right here, we instead just do T of n to the little o of 1. So we get tired of writing so many log factors, and we just raise to the power of little o of 1 instead. Okay. Have fun with that. Okay. So to summarize the following corollary to the Cook-Levin sharpened theorem is the slowdown theorem. If satisfiability is in deterministic time n to the c, so c is a constant, then non-deterministic time n to the d is in deterministic time n to the c times d plus the low of 1 for the log factors. And so the point here is the, to prove the corollary, just say non-deterministic time n to the d can be converted to an instance of sat of size about n to the d, plus the little of one stuff. Uh, and then if sat is in deterministic time n to the c, that instance of sat of size n to the d can be solved in time about n to the d times c. Okay. So that's just the slow, slow down theorem is that. Okay. So this is one of the important ingredients for all alternation trading proofs is the slow down theorem. Uh, the other one, well, actually, we'll get to it. Uh, let's state the results first. So DTS, so D is for deterministic, T for time, S for space. DTS, N to the C, is a set of problems that can be solved by a Turing machine, well, sorry, by, ran by random access machine that has both its runtime bounded by N to the C and its space bounded by N to the little o of 1. Well, I'm leaving off the little of ones for the most part. So it's runtime is n to the c plus the little of one and space n to the little of one. So if that sounds like a complicated way to think about it, think of log space but with an additional time bound of n to the c. And for n to the c, think of something like one point, think of c as being something like 1.5 or something like that. But series of results came out of work by, uh, well, it goes back to Naponishi and Kanan, but then Fortnow really started this line of work. You can see other names here on the screen. Uh, leading up to the best numeric bounds so far have been obtained by Williams, who showed that if C is less than 2 cosine pi over 7, then satisfiability cannot be computed in DTS n to the C. Okay? So 2 cosine pi over 7, uh, strange number. So the first time I heard this, I was like, that can't be right. <laughs> you know, of course, how could that be a real number in this setting, right? So, but in fact, uh, Williams and I were able to show a few years later that with current proof methods, this 2 to the cosine pi over 7 is optimal. The current proof methods can't do better than this. Um, and how can one define the current proof methods? In this case, I will define current proof methods. <laughs> yes, I will actually define a set of axioms. I may not, at least I'll put them up on the screen. We'll see how much time I have to talk about them. But I will give you rules of inference that prove things about satisfiability not being in a class. And th then you say the theorem is these rules of inference can't do better than 2 cosine pi over 7. OK. So, Naponishi's method. Am I pronouncing this, I hope, close enough to the truth? So, we need a, another definition. There's a, a slew of superscripts here, and I apologize for that, but I didn't make this notation up, so don't blame me, please. Uh, so, superscript B, so B, C, D, and E are, are real numbers. Superscript B means the inputs to the, cl to the computational class have length n to the B. Let's forget those plus O of ones. I'm not going to say them anymore, but they're always there. 
okay? The algorithm then existentially chooses n to the c many bits, okay? It keeps some of the information but throws away some of it and passes n to the d many bits onto a procedure which uses time n to the e and space n to the little o of one. I should probably say this again. We have a parameter n that's controlling the values. The input has length n to the b. We existentially guess n to the c many bits. We keep in memory n to the d many bits, maybe erase some of them. And then we run deterministically for time n to the e using space little o of one. I should have mentioned earlier, the input size has big size like n to the b. The input size doesn't count in the space bound. So we have a read-only input tape, a read-only in input memory. It's only the working space that counts towards the space bound. So the input is fixed. You can read it, but you can't change it. You've got working space and, and a little of one. Now the speed up theorem is that if you, oh, if you leave off the quantifier, it sort of has the obvious meaning. This means take inputs of length n to the b, run for time n to the c with space n to the low of one. Any predicate that can be accepted in this class can also be computed with, takes inputs of length n to the b, chooses n to the x many inputs, let's ignore the next superscript, it universally chooses n to the little o of one, so that's z n to the zero means n to the zero plus little o of one, so a small number of bits, and then it calls a deterministic machine that runs in time c minus x. So it's called a speed up because we start off with something that runs in time n to the c, and we show that it can instead be computed in time n to the c minus x, but the problem is, or the catch is, that of course you have to make some non-deterministic choices. Okay. But let me prove this theorem, nice theorem, and I can fit it on one slide. Uh, I've, for your convenience, I've put at the top of the screen the theorem, and I simplified by assuming x is greater than or equal to b. So we're trying to show that we're given something, it really doesn't work to point at the screen, does it? We're given something that takes input of length n to the b and runs in time n to the c. So here's a picture of it. I think of the time as going from left to right, total time n to the c. The sp space is n to the little o of one, thus it's a very, you know, I think of space as going up and down. It's a, it's a narrow little thing because it's not using much space. The input size of n to the b doesn't count against the space, so it, we're only looking at the stuff that changes. What we do is we're going to split the computation into blocks. We split the computation into n to, n to the x many blocks. We, the algorithm existentially guesses the memory contents at each block boundary. So it guesses memory contents here, 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 and so forth. So how much does that take? Well, we're guessing n, it's space n to the little of one. So we don't, we guess a very small amount of memory for each block. We did n to the x many blocks. So it's n to the x plus the little one memory needed to guess those things. Then we need to say that once we've guessed the blocks con block boundary values, we want to say they're all correct. But rather than verify they're all correct, we universally, co-non-deterministically, choose one block to check. To co-non-deterministically choose those things, we just need to pick some integer between 0 and n to the x, which is a you know, log, it's like order log n many bits. Okay, so thus we need only n to the O of 1 many bits to choose which block to sim simulate. And then we simulate that block in time n to the c minus x, because each block, there are n to the x many blocks, blocks. the total run time was n to the c, so each block has length n to the c minus x. Okay, good. So, okay, so that's the main, so that's the sec, we had the slowdowns theorem earlier, now this was the speed up theorem. The speed up theorem is from this, speed up theorem. So we're now going to put these together. So an alternation trading proof, it's a proof that satisfiability is not in DTS end of the C, uh, by contradiction. 
You start off by assuming sat is in DTS n to the C, and then we're going to prove that DTS n to the A is a subset of DTS n to the B for some A greater than B, and we arrive at a contradiction from that by a method I don't actually want to bother to explain, but it's not hard. Okay. The lines of alternation trading proof have the following form. There's a series of quantifiers starting off with the input of length n to the 1, just length n, and you have existential, u universal, et cetera, down to DTS, hence alternation, right? And we're going to use two kinds of inferences, speed up inferences that add quantifiers and reduce runtime, and slow down in inferences that reduce quantifiers and increase runtime. Okay. And I think I'm doing okay on time. Good. So here's the rules of inference. Uh, don't worry too much about this slide. I'll go through it somewhat, but if you don't get all the details, I'll give you an example on the next slide, which will be pretty easy to understand. But we have basically, we've got speed up inferences and slow down inferences. The initial speed up is just the following. DTS n to the a. So here we've got n to the a. Over here, it's a subset of n to the a minus x. There's a runtime, but I've added a quantifier, exists n to the x on the front, and a for all n to the zero. So it matches the format of the, the speed up theorem for four. Then there's the general speed up where we've already got a block of quantifiers on the front. So there's this dot, dot, dot here. This refers to a block of quantifiers that I'm not writing for you. An existential quantifier here, DTS n to the ak plus one. I'm going to add a quantifier. Instead of having a single existential quantifier there after the dot, 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 I've now got an existential quantifier and a, and a universal quantifier, so I've added a quantifier. But the runtime goes from n to the ak plus 1 to n to the ak plus 1 minus x. And the existential quantifier here, we basically merge this existing existential quantifier, n to the a to the k, with another existential quantifier, n to the x. Right? So when you combine them, it's like n to the x, uh, it was exists x, exists n to the ak, exists x to the, exists n to the x, but together that just makes the max, right? And so basically it's just the max of x ak there. We've got the for all n to the zero. Ignore these other superscripts. So this is a general speed up. And we also allow the dual rules, so the, the, you know, we can change the exist to for alls, and we get the dual rules and the, and the for alls to exist. And there's a slowdown. Here we make the assumption that sat is in DTS end of the C, and that tells us that if we have a exist end of the AK, DTS end of the AK plus one, we can get rid of the non-deterministic exists n part by running for an extra time factor of C. And unfortunately, the C, it's n to the C times, well, C times everything in sight, right? T C times B, C times, or C times BK, C times AK, C times BK plus 1, C times AK plus 1, where these BK, BK plus 1, AK and AK plus 1 are the existing superscripts there. So here we remove a quantifier, but we increase the runtime by factor C. And that's under the presumably false assumption that SAT is in DTS and of the C, but we're trying to disprove the possibility that SAT is in DTS end of the C, so that's perfectly allowable. So, okay, so I'm not going to do any more there. I know many of you haven't caught that, so let me just go on to an example. So, here's the simplest alternation trading proof. Let C be between 1 and the square root of 2. Suppose, for sake of contradiction, that SAT is in DTS end of the C. So, DTS of, n, of time n squared, we do a, the uh, Neoponache speed up method. We add an existential quantifier, exists n, and a universal quantifier for all n to the little of 1, DTS n to the 1. So, you know, 1, well, 2 minus 1 is 1. So it's a valid use of speed up. We now have two quantifiers to get rid of. We get rid of the for all quantifier using our assumption that sat is in DTS n to the C. So, of course, therefore, uh, co-NP is, is also in this type of class, co-sat. So this for all DTS n to the 1 can become a DTS n to the C. So we got rid of the quantifier at the cost of increasing the runtime by factor of C. Now we've still got a quantifier present. And uh, 
we do the same thing again. DTS into the C, we get rid of this quantifier by introducing another uh, increase in the runtime by fact, you know, C goes from N, N to the C to N to the C squared. So we get DTS N squared is a subset of DTS N to the C squared squared. If c squared is less than c, so if c is less than the square root of 2, we get a contradiction out of this. Okay? And there you go. This is a theorem of Lipton and Vigilis uh, from 1999, proved it by essentially this method. Okay. So we want to generalize this proof method. So this used a speed up, a slow down, and a slow down. So I use 1 for speed up, 0 for slow downs. 1, 0, 0 was the pattern of rules here. The idea is you pick your pattern of rules and then you pick your constants to make the optimal thing. So, for instance, with a slightly better argument, Fortnow, Van, Mel Van Melkbeek and others showed that if SAT is not in, D if SAT is not in DTS end of the C for C less than 1.618, the golden ratio. Uh, Williams did a real series of experiments who, who you know, said the best refutation was seven in, inferences, and he used uh, Maple for this. So he ran through all possible ways of ordering inferences of length seven and all possible ways of setting the exponents in, op, in an optimal way. And he found the best method was, you know, a, a speed up, speed up, slow down, slow down, speed up, slow down, slow down. One, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero. Uh, you got a number about one to the, one, one point six. It's not exact, but something close to that. Lev wants to ask a question. No, I forgot who was the first one to to use this method to to get some bound. Uh, well, Fortnow gave some bounds, not using quite this method, uh, in '98 or something like that. I had on the earlier slide. That's where I first heard it was '98, '97. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I first heard him talk about it in '98 at the Logic Colloquium in Prague. Mm -hmm. uh, but he didn't quite use this method. But he sort of was the one who showed that these kind of things should work. Okay, and I guess the uh, van, the 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 alter, these these rules here I gave were formulated explicitly, probably first by Ryan by Ryan Williams, but Van Melkebeek's work before that more or less had it in it already. So I say people sort of tended towards this thing rather than being full blown from nothing, right? So it's a series of results. Yeah, it's sufficiently remarkable that such a trick via this Nepomniachtchi uh, alternation could yield any, any useful information about this? Yes, it's, it's quite remarkable. Of course, the basic proof methods go back to the late 60s, right? So it could have been done many years ago. Um, I'm going the wrong way. So the optimal method, so uh, Ryan, Ryan Williams then pushed this further. And here's where he, he uh, did, again, maple search and then sort of intuited from the maple search up to, up to proofs with about 50 steps. He couldn't exhaustively search all possible proofs of 50 steps, but he did a, you know, a bunch of trial things and intuited out of this uh, proofs that have length that show that SAT is not in DTS end, end of the C for C less than 2 cosine pi over 7, as I discussed, 1.801. And here's the patterns he found. You know, one, I'm using regular expression notation, 1 to the n, 1, 0 star, 0, 1, 0 star, n. Okay? So, uh, basically, to get this, you make n go larger and larger, and 1, one 0 star, you run it even longer. Right, okay. And uh, these were conjectured by him to be the best possible refutations. So, in fact, this is the case with the rules of inference that I gave you earlier. And of course, people have tried very hard to give improved rules of inference. We haven't found any. So, uh, and just to remind you, this is sort of like a way of showing, towards showing L is not equal to NP. If SAT was not in DTS end of the C for all C greater than 1, then we would know SAT is not in log space. So log space would not be equal to NP would be a, a fairly good result. Okay. So the theorem here implies some kind of limits on how diag diagonalization can be used to proving L not equal NP, but only under current methods. And so I've been, I must say, I've been giving this talk for vari variations on it for a couple of years, and I keep waiting. I figure the minute you publish a paper saying, here's the best way to prove things, you're bound to have someone come up with a better method that proves you false. But so far, no one has. So uh, I encourage everyone to think about it, though. Um, let me see here. Oh, good. 
So let me just mention briefly some other work that we got into this. So far, I've been doing with space and end of the zero, and well, end of the little o of one. So like log space, for instance. But you can also generalize these methods to use small space, like end of the epsilon, plus the little o of one, of course. So it's worth mentioning, maybe at this point, that space end of the epsilon is pretty small. If you're trying to solve an instance of satisfiability of length n, it may have as many as n variables. So a satisfying assignment is going to have length n. Right? So n to the epsilon is not enough room even to save the satisfying assignment. So if you had some way to, even if you had some way to get the satisfying assignment, you wouldn't have any way to save it in memory all at once. So, you know, it is a pretty strong restriction on space. But let's now res relax the restriction somewhat. Space n to the epsilon. So we now d tisp, that's deterministic time space, n to the c, n to the epsilon. It's a class of problems solvable you know, deterministically on a random access machine in simultaneous time bounds n to the c plus the low of one and n to the epsilon plus the low of one. So we can then expand the notion of alternation training proofs very much analogous to what I talked about earlier to show that for various values of c and epsilon, sat is not in d tisp n to the c n to the epsilon. And it's the same kind of thing. You show that d tisp alpha c alpha epsilon is a subset of d tisp n to the beta c n to the beta epsilon for some alpha greater than beta, and you get a contradiction from that. Under the assumption, of course, that um, sad is in d tisp n to the c n to the epsilon. So there's still speed up and slow down and all that kind of stuff still works. So here's the, the, the uh, trade-off. So he, unlike the earlier case where we had a nice uh, two cosine pi over seven, if, well, if that's your idea of nice. At least we had a closed form expression for the bounds. Here we just have numerical values. So basically we ran a bunch of computer-based searches for the optimal proofs. We have a bunch of theorems on how to prune the search space. And up to five digits of accuracy and the, the limits of 16-digit floating point precision, <laughs> right? Here are the optimal values. If you fix epsilon, Suppose you want to use epsilon equal to 0.5, so space is, you know, square root of n, then there's no algorithm that runs in time 1.34070, okay. Uh, of course, as epsilon goes close to zero, we, as you expect, get back to 2 cosine pi over 7. As you get close to 1, you, you, you zoom in there with a slope approaching 1 half, <laughs> okay. But we don't have any closed form solution for these things, so that's our state of the art here. Um, so let me end up by not mentioning most of these open problems, but let me just, you know, just mention the last open problem here. The most interesting open problem really would be to give new methods besides what we can do currently with slow down and speed up. Try to go beyond the proof methods that I've given, or that, 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 I've, that I've talked about, I should say, not, not that I've given, and, uh, you know, but make obsolete the theorem that 2 cosine pi over 7 is the best you can do. Uh, the other comment maybe uh, is there's this sort of general philosophy that diag diagonalization gets more powerful if you have better methods of simulation. So you notice the limits on this time hierarchy, there's this unwanted log factor there because we have limits on how well a two-space Turing machine can simulate a k-space Turing, a two tape Turing machine can simulate a K tape Turing machine to our current state of knowledge. So more generally, if we give more efficient algorithms, we can give better di diagonalizations and better separations. So on the other hand, if, so if P is equal to NP, say, we certainly have some new unknown algorithms out there, better algorithms for satisfiability. On the other hand, to prove P not equal to NP, it seems like the only method at our disposal is to give better algorithms so as to give better diagonalization. So in either scenario, one should expect better algorithms. So I want to suggest maybe the best way to prove separations is to try to give better algorithms because it seems very likely that they exist. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. It's possible. Thank you very much. Now we have time for questions. Moshe, please. So when you do alternation, when you do alternation trading, 
as far as I could see, you didn't use the Stockmeyer, you know, pass, pass doubling technique, right? They use alternation of quantifier to show, to, to reduce P space to QBF. So you chopped it into these small blocks, but I didn't see that you used the, the Stockmeyer technique of, of getting a, a small, very small alternation to talk about a very long path. Is it relevant here? So, this, I'm, so you're asking about the Stockmeyer technique for alternation? P space, sure. P space in QBF, but you, oh. do, you do it using a low alternation, right? You take right. this exponentially large path, and you do it with n quantifiers. Right. So when you chop this uh, long computation into small blocks, can you try to use the same idea of, of uh, splitting in the middle and then uh, using QBF techniques to do it, use alternation there? Right. So the question is, if I understand it correctly, so we have the method of, well, Chan, Chan Dracos, and Stockmeyer of showing that P space is in QBF, or QBF is complete for, for P space, where you do a series of alternating quantifiers. Right. Yes, yes. Um, in some sense, the Nepomuchus-Panache Savage method of doing this kind of divide and conquer is it's like the base case of the Chandrakos and Stockmeyer method. So there's some chance, I suppose, that uh, something that does multiple alternations of this type could, could, could yield something. I don't know any way to make that work, but uh, it's definitely something to try. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Well, maybe I will ask a general question. So, okay. So this, um, where do, do you think it all leads to? So, so far, okay. There is this uh, very interesting method, which suddenly produced some numerical bounds. I would say. Uh, right. Where you, which you can really compute, and there is some even uh, limit to these um, kind of bounds you can obtain. So, uh, is there hope to uh, get m more more like this from versions of alternation, or maybe more general kind of alternations, or something like this? Is there a hope to uh, to get more stronger results in this? Well, um, I mean, I think the PNP problem is something we should be able to resolve. It doesn't feel to me like the kind of thing that's unsolvable or undes you know, und undecidable in some sense, like some of the questions of set theory might be and so on. So yes, I think we should be able to solve it. Um, uh, but do well. you feel that diagonalization can be relevant to this? Well, I mean, after this, uh, you know, or Oracle results, there were yeah. kind of universal feeling that diagonalization is dead and we should invent some yeah, totally see. new combinatorial methods. But uh, I, don't, I don't really agree with that. So I mean, the point is, di everyone says, oh, diagonalization doesn't work. But let me sketch for you a potential proof by diagonalization. So for instance, per, you might be able to show that uh, exponential time is in the, pol in the polynomial time hierarchy. So maybe seven alternations of quantifiers at, in polynomial time gives you all of exponential time. It's plausible because we don't understand algorithms very well that use many alternations. But if you have that, then immediately the time hierarchy, p is not equal to exponential time, would tell you that p is not equal to np, because if p is equal to np, it would be the, poly the polynomial time hierarchy. So everyone says that Oracle results prevent proofs by diagonalization, but in fact, just a new algorithm for exponential time would immediately give p not equal np by diagonalization. So there's nothing impossible about getting proofs by diagonalization. Okay. Okay. Oh. Well, if Max Kanovich has no question, <laughs> then we will uh, just uh, stop here and. Alternating machine, they provide a very interesting correlation because P space is equal alternating in uh, linear time. So maybe it's clearly, I agree with Moshe, that clearly there is very similar what you are doing. <laughs> yes, replacing, I, I replacing for deterministic exponential time by the sequence of alternation. Right, so the question for Max yeah. is uh, there's a lot of sort of analogous results that feel similar. So like uh, 
non-deterministic space is in space n squared, or non-deterministic space is equal to co-non-deterministic yeah. space. There's a lot of sort of similar results there. So this is in, definitely in the same line and maybe gives us some reason for hope. <laughs> okay, well, let us thank the speaker for an interesting, though perhaps a bit technical lecture, but uh, yeah, thank you very much. It was really appreciated. Okay, thank you.